thanks a lot for accepting our invitation at a very short notice and then uh, uh, here we are and suman kalyanji is joining us from canada at the moment uh, so to start it uh, suman ji uh, your entire journey itself uh, be it from iit madras where you did your undergraduate in naval architecture and then followed up with uh, ms in uh, uh, forecasting and for, for, from there on uh, be it product development be it business development be it uh, strategy positioning of various enterprise related tech solutions uh, and even being a consultant uh, and now uh, Uh, associating yourself with an israeli company uh, which has its uh, internal uh, oh i mean uh, i think uh, foot uh, they in this entire journey if you can please uh, take us through okay how it had been and i think uh, you have seen through this uh, technology uh, bubble in 2000 or maybe that innovation and then now we are talking about the next fourth industrial revolution as sahil ji said uh, ai playing a major role and in this 30 years now we are standing at a place where shuman kalyan ji is again pioneering uh, in terms of ai which is the latest technology so how could you be so agile and uh, it will be i think a great uh, insight for all of us your career path till now thank you thank you thank you sujikar and thank you um, salil uh, sri bhai ji for the for the kind introduction and uh, welcome this opportunity to speak today share my thoughts on ai and uh, i've had a career of almost 23 years now and running in in the in the domain of ai and it's been a nice journey if and mostly it's been a very interesting journey so i'm going to share my journey on what led me to this point and as uh, Jikar was talking about how this journey started first with my admission into IIT and how by accident I came into this domain, but I consolidated and how I, why I am where I am at this at this point of time. It was not all by design, but I think one thing led to the other, which uh, things happening at the right time and how I landed up in this in this domain. It's it's an interesting story in itself. But before that, let me just start off in a lighter note. uh i think i know uh, sujikar ji was saying uh, he please, was talking please, uh, about... please take the liberty of calling me sujikar sujikar okay so sujikar was talking about the examination time so i know these could be jittery for some and then think okay how am i going to do in my exams and my guess is most of you uh, guys listening to this live are pre final and the final year students across different streams across different probably engineering uh you know economics finance commerce maybe different streams that you're coming from and to start off on a lighter note i mean examination is something that if i remember it's been like ages since i've taken an examination and the sort of examination where you study and you know you have to you have to do enough to excel or as the case maybe pass an examination and i would always be amongst all my friends i would be somebody who would be the most peaceful most calm and i would be like playing games and i would be like completely at ease completely relaxed and people used to wonder you know how come you're not stressed out i mean you look like completely you could you go for a movie and wow how and how is that so <laughs> the secret was really i think that was when the ai really started in a certain sense because i would look at all of this question papers try to analyze and try to predict what do you think might come my way i think that's how i used to approach examinations <laughs> looking at it the smart way as opposed to reading everything <laughs> i mean i was not the kind of person who would sit down and study everything i would say okay i need to read enough and i think i was lucky and probably my analysis was pretty good that i was able to predict maybe ye came naturally to you yeah exactly <laughs> so i i was kind of in more more often than not i was able to predict what do you think might come my way and so that kind of helped me i mean i would not claim i was a topper in my class but i did enough to pass and maybe did did better than that so i think that was the on the lighter way so it was very relaxing for me in during examination because one of the key lessons learned really uh, jokes apart is uh, being able to work smart as opposed to working hard i mean working hard plus smart is great i mean that's the best 
but working smart is absolutely essential because you really want to go on a path which is outcome driven where you know what the outcome you are trying to seek and make sure you are channeling all your energies towards achieving those outcomes so it's very that's one of the first lessons i learned in life now the journey when it started from iit when i uh, got my admission into I, i you know based on my rank i had two or three uh, subjects that were available to me in iit i think naval arc was one amongst them and i decided to take up naval architecture because a it sounded cool b i thought wow this like you know ship building and i was always fascinated with ships and boats in my life so i think iit madras is the only place which gives degree on naval architecture right yes absolutely i think kharagpur as well okay okay, okay. only two yeah very very yes absolutely speak so I, i joined that and it was a great course very very mathematical and it was it was a tough course it was not an easy course as you can imagine it was mechanical engineering you not only had to study all of the course work that mechanical engineering students did but over on top of that subjects like hydrodynamics yes. uh, being able you know propeller design and all those sort of thing which are more specific to naval architecture so after i uh, graduated uh, from naval architecture i had a decision to make and that's that's probably the decision that all of you are uh you have to make up your mind where to go next and all of my friends the conventional wisdom was during those days okay you are from iit you need to apply app and go abroad right that was a conventional wisdom or the second path was oh uh, should i do an mba now both of these paths didn't appeal to me frankly first thing is i don't know why i should be going abroad because i felt that our indian government having invested so much in me i really i wanted to give something back to the country for sure so there was a deep desire to not just go away just because you know okay i had this idea i i need to go abroad i, I didn't i i didn't appeal to much and mba not really too much at that time because i felt that iit had trained me for a career in technology i said look i'm not going to do justice to this my degree if i get into mba maybe i might be, do an mba at some point of time in my life but it didn't really appeal to me but in my a uh, btech there was one course that in particular appealed to me a lot it was a course in probability and statistics you know that i kind of really connected to that because i could see that how probability and statistics played into real life in terms of how you may predict when you're trying to predict something you can only predict with a certain degree of confidence and and there was a statistical approach behind so i that appealed to me because that seemed very real to me in terms of because i felt in life there are situations where things work things do not work so it's full of possibilities so i realized that statistics was one very important discipline which was uh, which related to every other field that i could so i said okay look i'm going to take this up so and i continued my education in iit so i signed up for a masters in forecasting because i thought that was a logical extension of my interest in probability and statistics so while i was going through this course of uh, a masters by research in the area of forecasting that's when i got introduced to ai for the first time there was a course offered by the computer science department uh, it was called introduction to neural networks and i really that fascinated that course really fascinated me so i decided to take that up after figuring out what this course was about and i really fascinated me that when i understood that they were trying to use models of human brain of neuroscience to see how you could use that as a foundation for creating an intelligent systems so so far uh, till that point of time uh, ai was more like a kind of a generalized concept where they were looking at a generalized artificial intelligence and they had limited success because till that point of time they were all these rules based systems and then when they figured out that real life is so complex that you actually cannot ha- cannot have rules based system to mimic intelligence this to me it sounded very fascinating because uh, it was approaching the problem like a human brain would process information i really i think i really like that connected to that concept so i took that course i didn't need to actually i didn't really need to i just audited that course purely out of interest and i'm glad i did that because that really set me off on a new journey i really loved the course and then i decided to use part of the neural networks in my own research into forecasting so i think that's where sri asrikar uh you were talking about forecasting so that's where i first introduced ai during those times into how do i use neural networks and this uh, uh, basically artificial neural networks to be able to do much better forecasting than all of the forecasting models that were existing at that point of time 
so that's that's how it started and uh, i i think it was a well appreciated thesis and after i graduated from there i think my first job too i wanted to uh, continue my job in machine learning so in my first job i found a very interesting offer from satyam computers at that time i mean it's i, I mean this credit organization today but it was yes, one yes, of the tech mahindra now <laughs> yeah it is tech mahindra now. But, but it was one of the point, pioneering uh, service software service organizations in india Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, speaker. So I think the the late '90s specifically, uh, it was riding on a high. Satyam was riding on a high. Yes. They had some really interesting projects, and uh, there was one of those needs in Satyam that really fascinated me. They were looking for somebody with a neural networks background, and who could do software, who could write, uh, who could write code as well. And as you can imagine, uh, because of my research, I did end up learning coding as well. at the time to be able to implement all of these uh, ai algorithms so i kind of had a little bit of a coding experience if you will before i applied for this job so i think i kind of fit that very well because they were looking for somebody who could write code uh, and also be able to uh, implement ai so i think i spent a couple of years of time uh, just implementing building products based on machine learning implementing all of these algorithms i spent the first couple of years of time so i think from uh, yeah sorry sumit i think yeah no no go ahead, please i mean maybe many of us including me would be of the opinion that ai is a con- as a concept as a technology is very new okay maybe after 2, 2010 okay year 2010 however here we are listening from <laughs> you that uh, you started from the moment you wanted to be in a professional system on yes. ai itself so this is like an enlightening moment for all of us okay this is something which is very old maybe found its prominence now Yes, no, absolutely, Srikar. Actually, the response to your question is—it's uh, just not a uh, 1990s. You know, the journey of AI really started in 1950s. Actually, a lot of people don't know that. So it all started with a couple of remarkable people. One of them was called Alan Turing, and the second uh, influential person was called Marvin Minsky. Now, very interesting people. Now, this started really in 1950s. So, Alan Turing came up with this. computing machine generalized computing machine and he was he was considered the father of computer science he is also considered the father of ai and uh, if you so sreekar i'm not sure whether you watched this movie called the imitation game uh, which is a very very well done movie and that really is a story of alan turing about how he cracked he also was into cryptography ai computer science uh, you know uh, numerical optimization he was he was a genius so and i then, think yeah uh-huh. yeah sorry Uh, so i think this brings to uh, this particular scenario of maybe the infrastructure development of late and uh, the uh, the usage of internet be becoming very close to most of the population in the world i think has fostered the things and maybe got this ai ko push kiya but i think its journey started somewhere in 1950s as we see it right now yeah absolutely yeah. and so, th- while yes. while minsky yeah, yeah. and Alan Turing, as you pointed out, Srikar, as these two gentlemen started in 1950s. But you're right. The what really accelerated this entire AI movement was compute. I mean, in one word, compute storage. This really mm-hmm. triggered revolution. Because uh, even when I was doing my masters, all the algorithms and the theoretical framework was already in place by then. The foundation for AI was already laid by the time it was 1990s. And but however. we didn't have enough compute we didn't have such compute environments during that time which allowed somebody to apply these large neural networks to problems with where the data was very huge yes. and that that where the true value was and and they could not apply that and so for a long time it it existed more in as a theoretical computer science discipline where yes. it was to do that as a course but people say hey look you know this is great but how much is it practical can you really apply that so that's kind comes back to your observation yes. that since only in the last 10 15 years <clears throat> once you all of this entire compute took off your storage became much cheaper uh, and <clears throat> cloud computing came into picture now these days internet getting very accessible super fast yeah, exactly. so all of these kind of led towards now ai becoming mainstream right but interestingly the theoretical framework was already there in place right. by It, now it is very evident that uh, uh, your your travel with AI was from last twenty three years. Yes. So yeah, uh, I can and we can even uh, see that uh, 
okay now when you're trying to explain things in terms of ai there is the deep understanding which is coming into picture on the face of it so uh, uh, i mean so that having to i mean applying that experience and maybe from your viewpoint if you can let us know at this moment uh, even though ai is uh, considered as the fourth industrial revolution are taking its central role in technology propagation uh, ma major people if you if we consider uh, uh, the student community who are about to get into professionals as uh, someone from elite institutions uh, who wanted to be entrepreneurs as one set and then someone who uh, from elite institutions want to get into job and uh, uh, there are other set of students who uh, have to fight it out in order to find their space okay when compared to the other two categories okay from these students perspective at this moment uh, as we were discussing earlier also there seems to be a perceived or imaginary barrier for all these people to venture into a as the first step so from your experience can you let us know is there is such barrier really exist or um, is it imaginary first of all the second thing is even though if there is a barrier even if it is big or small how these people to cross it and then uh, see their future in air no very very good question srikar so let me try to explain what those barriers are very good question because barrier does exist and i want to talk about what that perceived barrier is and how do students overcome it but before i get to that in terms of let me uh, if you don't mind uh, making a quick point on please please what, why ai is important today is is a, is actually really a moot point today because you see evidence of ai everywhere i mean yeah. if you hit go to google search and hit a google search there is ai happening in the background you go for a shopping experience on amazon or any of those there is ai working behind the scenes you go to netflix to watch content and there is an ai algorithm that is constantly un understanding trying to understand you so every everything that you interact with in life today is becoming more and more smarter in a certain sense and there is ai behind it so there is so in a sense you could argue that ai is already there it has disrupted already it's already around you it's already around you in your daily life and it is already beginning to impact everybody's daily life so there is obviously everybody has to understand what this ai is how do they interact with it and how does it impact in the future so clearly you need to understand that now in terms of the barriers so speaker the barriers are this right a lot of people first barrier is people tend to think it is very abstract it is very mathematical i probably will not be people might think hey you know what i probably will not be able to handle this i need to spend years uh, understanding math maybe getting a degree in math to be able to understand that is one barrier number one yeah and to that i i say that it is actually not as much as a barrier that you think it is and let me put it that way so and uh, why am i saying this a uh, the math itself mostly students from stem disciplines who are coming from a stem and kind of a technical background math is not a barrier for them it is less of a barrier let me put it that way but on the other hand the level of math that you really need for being a successful let me call a data scientist if you will because that is one of those roles that actually got created due to ai revolution now every company has data scientists today the level of math is really university level and that kind of university level math whether you are from a commerce background you are from economic background you are from computer background engineering background any of those unless you are from a completely arts background in which you have absolutely no exposure to math at all basic level of university math is actually good enough for you to uh build a foundation okay. that is that is a that is a perceived and it's 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 not hard to solve it today a uh, speaker learning the paradigm of learning has changed today you no longer suppose somebody needs to get into ai and they feel okay look i must upgrade my basic math skills you don't have to go back to university anymore you don't have to spend 2 years getting uh, an ms program in data science or you don't have to get an ms program in computer science to be a data scientist yes. all you need is a basic understanding that i need a basic level of math today there are enough dime and dozen resources out in the internet for you that will be take yeah sorry go ahead. yeah sorry sorry i was talking about yeah these sources which they have online sources which they can uh, apply to and in 2 3 months they can um well versed themselves with 
becoming a data scientist or whatever it is yeah please yes please. yes correct so so that math is really not a barrier i think that's what i wanted to get out of the way first yeah and even for somebody is not from a traditional stem kind of discipline i mean imagine i have somebody on my, on the call today dr shubhra who was the previous speaker he was training to be a medical doctor mm-hmm. but then she then she had to relearn math i mean she is coming from a background in which she was supposed to get into healthcare but she pivoted in her life learned math enough math for her her to be able to handle math maybe not towards ai but enough of sophisticated math to be able to get into marketing do analysis work with analytics which is, which itself requires of i would say fairly high highly high skill high level of math so it, it's possible i think it's a question of how do you how do you get to that point are you motivated enough to be able to go and make that effort towards actually learning that kind of math that is the first barrier and i think it can be solved from my experience i've seen so why you will see a lot of data science professionals in the industry today with ms and phd backgrounds in math computer science or data science which itself actually has got created as a new stream both at undergrad and post grad levels nowadays but the point that uh, but i'm trying to make is you can either train to be a very theoretical kind of data scientist into building algorithms from scratch if you come from these sort of backgrounds but remember in ai too there are broadly there are two you can e- be a theoretician in terms of inventing new algorithms inventing new ways of understanding data or you can be a practical applied data scientist where you can take a concept and apply mm-hmm. so that kind of let me said and most of the what the industry needs today they they need both of course now there will be a need for very theoretical kind of data scientists in really high end tech for very specialized jobs but i would say 90 to 95% of the jobs that i have seen uh, across multiple industry verticals whether it's telecom healthcare retail or any of these big industries the need is really for somebody who's who can very practically apply this very practically Oh, I, th- I think I got disconnected. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, so, so Manjay, I think we lost you for a bit of ten seconds or so. You can please. Yeah. Continue. So, so yeah, speak up. So, all I'm uh, the point I'm making is whatever, regardless of what background that you may come from, uh, you can make those efforts to cross that barrier of math. Number one. Now that how about other barrier? Other barrier which I hear student ask me, oh, you know, I don't have any work experience in this. How do a why do you think somebody is going to? Uh, consider me or entertain my uh, job request right now this is a good question now this is the answer to that is really not it is like any other job that you are applying to i mean the question is okay do you have certain experience in this or not now to be able to answer that question the way to do that is what we do in uh, that is one of the reasons i i do a lot of kind of a course you know sessions if you will course work to with students where i kind of walk them through if you practically wanted to skill yourself not on not only just the technical side of how to apply these algorithms but take some practical use cases that you can actually build on your own and you build something like like a hobby is like if you will so there is a certain point there is a certain phase where you have to be call yourself a ai hobbyist if you will mm-hmm. so as a ai hobbyist can i take up some of the data and build some models myself in which i can actually go to an interview and demonstrate and say look this is what i did i improved on the performance one go- good example there is a portal called kaggle.com k a g g l e and these guys hold competitions uh-huh. any amateur data scientist hobbyist can go into that portal in fact there's prize money as well in fact there is there are leaderboards you can compete with different people around the world and you can build your own data science model submit your models and if you go to kaggle.com i mean i would urge you all to go and register in kaggle.com if you already have you already haven't done that it's an excellent portal yeah kaggle.com if you can spell i think it would be uh, they, yeah. they can write it down let me uh, let me just type it into the live chat that's right yes. yeah this is something yeah. that absolutely i i would encourage you to go and sign up for this not only a great resource for learning data science but allows you to be part of their leader boards be mm-hmm. part of their projects and if you if you are able to build good models 
which rank very well and you could also get to a situation where you actually can win prize money but regardless of whether you win prize money or not there's a huge learning experience of work that you do on this now also this barrier can be crossed in another way as well shrikant i Isn't think it? i think talking about the uh, i mean other other option of crossing this barrier if i can yeah. just uh, extend this uh, yeah. uh, from this um, from this particular barrier saying that okay as a hobby they can uh, maybe become a data scientist or work on this kind of projects now as we are entering more into a tech driven world and these days every company is being called a technology based company irrespective of wherever they are whatever they are doing okay uh, so in this scenario for the students who are just coming out at this moment into the professional world what are the minimum uh, technological uh, skill sets they need to possess along with maybe uh, this uh, being as hobbies earlier i think uh, maybe during your time it was car driving swimming all this are some of the skill sets or maybe <laughs> some of these hobbies which people have they can pursue to be okay uh, good thing so this way uh, moving forward for these people what are those technological skills excellent great question sujika mm-hmm. fantastic so sujika very right one thing good you have pointed out in this question is great you know math you know as a hobbies you can work with all this but what are those technology components that you need to know very good so i'll answer the question in two parts today in the job market i will talk about what kind of uh, roles or skills they are looking for from a technology perspective and the second part of the answer i can talk to you about how do you acquire, go and acquire those skills Please. so let me and that will answer your question first is today in the job market if you are looking for a data science job i think first thing i've already said you don't need to be a phd in math you don't need to be an ms in math or any of those data science that's a, that uh, you 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 got that part of it yes yes now from a technology perspective today the kind of jobs that your data scientist is definitely uh, is a, is one role that you keep hearing and everybody wants to be a data scientist now remember data scientist is not necessarily a software engineer as well data scientist is not expected to be a great software engineer being a great software engineer being able to develop code as according to the best software engineering practice is really nice to have but i would say it's not a must have because mm-hmm. a job of a data scientist is to analyze the business to see how can i improve certain business metrics based on ai no enough technology to be able to conduct experiments no enough technology to be able to build models but there are other roles like there is a role called machine learning engineer ml engineer yes now machine learning engineers are actually more in demand nowadays compared to data scientists because their level of technology skills whether it's python whether it's java i mean these are two of those uh, languages that are popularly used and i would say python at the top of the list that is the platform that is de facto standard for data science and ai today mm-hmm. and so ml engineers are more i would say they come from more of a software engineering background who have got into data science so they are approaching data science they are already coming from a very technical python background as a software engineer they are slapping on data science skills on top of that and that makes them marketable for a ml engineer kind of role mm-hmm. now there is another role called you, which you will keep hearing called devops ml ops and these kind of roles so these kind of roles are for uh, all those professionals who are not necessarily now looking at a development point of view but how do you create this ai systems at scale that operate flawlessly and seamlessly mm-hmm. how do you make it a painless experience for organizations to adopt ai and without things breaking and how do you create seamless and trouble free system so that they kind of approach the problem very differently now based on which whatever background you are coming from so sujika suppose you are you are going for a data scientist then your path would be uh, you know your you have just have to know enough of coding python if you will and the same way that you go to kaggle python is something which is actually i would say is a very simple language to learn for mm-hmm. being able to write code it is it is not as complex as uh, you know computer languages like c c++ and java used to be in the past because they are they are far more complex they are far more rigid strongly typed languages but python is more loose uh basically meant for somebody to get um you know busy very fast 
to learn very fast so python is something that you can as a hobby is i, I would suggest python is something which anyone can learn very easily we say it will be very useful yeah absolutely no in fact uh, i do when i teach data science uh, courses i also do teach data science courses i kind of take an approach of just teaching enough python for you to be dangerous as a data scientist let me put it that way. okay no python to be dangerous you don't have to be an expert at python now to just to be dangerous you need to know a few things well how do you handle how do you handle data structures okay how do you handle large volumes of data how do you work with matrices there are five or six things like that that you need to know well and that doesn't take very long to learn so i usually teach courses in such a way i don't really separate out saying the language from the core data science concept to me both of them go together it's a language for of expression so what i do is i just introduce just enough python for people to be dangerous so that you can train as a data scientist now somebody wants to train as an ml engineer a barrier for entry is slightly high for somebody who's come a complete non software kind of background because this is really highly technical so mm-hmm. i would suggest that always look at things like data analysis uh and of course there are other roles that you should consider as well in this entire ai space right ai is just not about being a data scientist you can also be a <coughs> expert on visualizations too i mean that is part of the mainstream analytics but to get to data science analytics also is also a great stepping stone for that you don't need to be expert you know you don't need to be an expert programmer for you should be able to work with all you need is just in have enough graphing skills if you will that's like really basic graphing skills how do you develop bar charts histograms and all of these and how do you use tools in the market like power bi and tableaus of the world to be able to learn how actually to do this visualization which is again not a barrier for entry is not very high mm-hmm. so so i think either all i'm saying is from a technology perspective it's if you are going, getting to be a data scientist i would say don't have to worry so much about technology the the learning that you have is enough python to be dangerous uh, you of course you will, as part of being a data scientist you will also learn some frameworks today like tensorflow pytorch and these some of these popular frameworks uh, to that that is typically applied for model building and that's enough to get you started now oh, yeah got it got got your point uh, so much yeah. i think for a data scientist the barriers are lower for mission learning engineer maybe they are a bit higher in a way but at this moment in the present uh, educational ecosystem we have proper opportunities to well versus ourselves and then take it forward from there um, yes right um now uh, extending uh, uh, a little bit more increasing the pie a little bit more in terms of uh, overview uh, if you are talking about technology based technology domain based jobs be it web development be it uh, mobile app development be it devops be it software engineering and even data science and associated uh, roles uh, moving forward in next 10 years can we can we have a overview of what percentage of jobs for example 100% occupies this entire tech domain maybe web development uh, will hold 30% of the jobs or data science will hold those mean percent can we have a perspective of that no absolutely no absolutely mm-hmm. so let's see what will happen to some of those uh, mainstream let's say engineering jobs if you will the mainstream software engineer Yes. now web development is an interesting exam- example sujikar ji and you know you already know that web development is getting more and more to a situation where even non technical people can start developing their own websites and we are already at that point today as you can see yes and you know let's say 15 years back you needed to know javascript you needed to know all this server side java frameworks and go through a long project for you to even get a basic website together today basic website i can just go and uh you know there are diamond dozen uh, tools around for me to very quickly put a website together yes yes just take uh, html sheets or uh, some images yeah. put in the right information we are done with the website in 5 minutes yeah exactly so it is getting to such a point now where the of course a web development i think where people are focusing more on the creative side of it how do i present a website that has maximum outreach how do i uh, get my digital marketing efforts through my website that's a that's a different problem and that requires a different different set of skills now in terms of the mainstream i think software itself if you see there is some very interesting work that is happening in ai now which will kind of minimize the need for you to be an expert programmer anymore i mean that will kind of start reducing where you will uh, increasingly see the level of software expertise 
actually uh, that requirement kind of go down because in the future ai will now today i'm seeing for example let me let me take an example there is a model today uh, in the industry called gpt3 it's called gpt3 and it was initially started with with by elon musk and uh, as part of the open ai alliance and today it is they spent around 12 to 15 million dollars building a model and they train that model on everything that they could find on the internet that's how big that model. it's called gpt3 and mm -hmm. it's it some amazing things now one of those amazing things that they are trying it for is can i apply this to code because code at the end of the day is also a language right see they train gpt3 on all the human language or the natural language that you find on the internet but we are trying to apply that on the very uh, the foundation of programming which is the language can i apply this on language can i generate language mm -hmm. so for for example in the future i would see in the next 10 15 years you go to a point where developers don't need to go from the they will have so many of these frameworks which are attached to natural language processing so if you are a logical thinker just using pseudo code and a certain level of commands i should be actually able to generate code okay so and, yeah i think so from web development now becoming anyone's job even coding yeah. is going to becoming become anyone's job moving forward maybe in another Yeah, we are moving towards that situation and not only that i am going to say that at some point of time in the future even a sort of data scientist job also will is going to change see today data scientist job predominantly is about building models uh, understanding business problems working with models doing all of these different experiments so data scientists are also today becoming uh, very domain experts also if you will because without understanding the nature of the business it's hard to build artificial intelligence models for those but mm -hmm. interestingly what will happen in the data science so today there's an entire field emerging in ai called auto ml auto machine learning where can i automate the process of actually even building a model why do i need a data scientist to manually spend all those hours cleaning up data uh, be able to build models manually why can't i automate that process where uh, i present data to an algorithm and the algorithm is, is able to figure out what is the best set of hyper parameters or or maybe even the best fit for a specific algorithm or best or a combination of these different ai algorithms to be able to solve a specific problem so even so the nature of a data scientist also will change because then he'll data science will become more of a kind of a think of it like a project manager for data science who's so just overseeing all these experiments <laughs> so i think from what you say i i clearly understand that which your profile you are in at this moment okay yeah. be it web development be it data scientist whatever it is be ready for disruption it is going to happen and it is going to happen very fast and so yes. be agile there okay it's not yes, about yeah, you're not guaranteed with uh, the technologies which you know at this moment sustain you through the life like uh, what our fa fathers are for fathers generally in the engineering uh, jobs then they had uh, were able to do but i think here we need to be agile enough to shift to new technologies and requirements as and they come up right i think that yes. is what no in fact the disruption that we that we are seeing uh, 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 sujika i think it will be very uh, interesting for the audience that listening to it is not just in this engineering software engineering jobs right the disruption is across the board see if you are let's say you are going for a sales career you want to go for a marketing career all of these fields are going to be completely disrupted today now marketing is one area that is going to be so dis so disrupted by data science because today marketing they talking about the language they call it hyper personalization where they are no longer uh, in the in the past marketing used to segment populations to understand your cu consumer behavior see whether they are consumers or telecom consumers whether they are your retail consumers or consumers across any other vertical in the in the old world they used to segment they used to say okay look let me try to understand different populations and then uh, either run some specific marketing campaigns or real time promotions or uh, they used to do that in the past today it's all hyper personalized it's all based on your individual the behavior of the individual now it is what how do you do marketing treatment in a such a specialized way by understanding the entire customer intimately through ai to see what kind of marketing action should i apply and when should i apply which will yield the maximum uh, return and at so the, the end of it uh, the digital uh, scenario coming into picture is making yeah. this possible right so uh, yeah. 
given that way so manji when i started my career 10 years back the way business development was handled then was very different from now okay there is a lot of disruption i think moving forward it will be even more disruptive as you said it is going to become hyper local and hyper personal hyper personal and so uh, you would observe you are right it is all an account of digitization is driving that you are absolutely correct because see once a, a customer whether he is signing up for a telecom service a customer is signing up for a utility service or any other service the way large companies are the way they manage that information is they have they they see the digital footprints of the customer right from the very start of the f- first engagement with your company so whether the engagement is happening through regardless of any channel whether the engagement is through call center whether you make a phone call or your engagement is through your digital websites or your engagement is through your mobile app channels yes information that you are generating is being collected they are, they are being uh, you know they go into your customer relationship management systems crm systems and from crm you have all of these different you know uh, data marts and data warehouses which collect yes. all of to be able to predict consumer i think i see a lot of automation already in place be it workflows be it email sequences or any other message sequences whatever it is uh, now for a business development executive or manager the role is entirely different yes i think at this moment so yeah and uh, suman ji uh, this one hour time uh, is becoming very very small for us to absorb <laughs> okay insights from you so if so with your permission have- Yeah. session all we can always do a follow up session but very fascinating discussion let's keep going yeah. so can we can we extend it till 7:15 in the interest of audience if you yeah, don't have any other, uh, yeah. commitment yeah. thank you thank you suman ji so yeah. i think we will discuss uh, maybe on one or two more questions from my yes. end and yes. then after which we will try to take questions from audience uh, tanvi okay. please help me with the questions yeah so now in terms of uh, i think uh, real world scenario at this moment we know disruption is happening because of ai and the job landscape itself is changing uh, as we right now discussed about marketing and sales domains getting disrupted a lot so in the next 5 6 years uh, what are the jobs which you see are going to go out of the market space because of the in advent of ai okay advent of ai now see immediately let's see the shift that is already happening today now i will talk i will give an answer based on the real situation that i am seeing uh, sujika please now in in the past right i think let's connect the dots where you had a certain disruption ha- happened because of internet because of information technology in the past and the kind of disruption what kind of jobs were lost but then there are different kind of nature of jobs that got added now here but there is one difference if you if you observe see in the past the disruption was on jobs which were slightly lower in the value chain in which which was very manual and it could easily be uh, easily be done by a machine those sort of jobs that kind of started but now you are coming to a situation where you are coming to an aspect of intelligence where decision making also can be enabled by ai and through this decision making today ai is strongly getting aligned to another area called which is called rpa or the robotic process automation or in general they just call it automation where based on the decisions that you take you can go to the last mile and actually make those changes mm-hmm. so that level of also the kind of jobs now that are beginning to get displaced are even higher up in the value chain something which yeah. requires more analysis yeah something, being supervisor manager and above decision making exactly. roles so it is going to disrupt the wider cross section of people previously at uh, the jobs you thought thought that you thought were safe because somebody had to do a lot of manual work analyzing data to be able to do that job and take a decision all of those managers and all of them will get because today in the future think of this situation sujika now in the future you will have all of this enterprise data in such a manner with this giant ai you know compute that is working on it which is able to translate business language into questions or the natural language questions into technical questions which can go and query data at real time get you the kind of insights that you need for driving a business and get and do all of that at real time i mean imagine that vision today yes. you're going through the entire value chain where what happens today so the directors of a specific department 
okay they say okay look i want to improve the business metrics of my department so they will have a team of uh, you know uh, business intelligence the specialists you little team of data analysts all of these guys putting together all of these reports analytics and all of that they do that but if you if i see into the future all of these different jobs will go away because ai will drive this to such an extent that ai and analytics itself will get merged into a big analysis capability that will be driven by language where you can just have a natural language you can have natural conversations you can you can have conversational bots where like every lot of these jobs will have work in the future you'll start seeing virtual assistants where for doing my job i have a virtual assistant and you know i i can figure out okay what do i think i should do next and based on the data it can analyze and it can tell you what are the different paths you should take so i think the way i see it here is maybe 10 15 years and maybe 20 years down the line even the uh, curriculum of mba or pg the masters of business uh, uh, i think courses need a revive i mean uh, rehashing there and <laughs> shaking yeah. up uh, because most of this people are getting trained for this kind of decisions right so that they yeah. get the data do business analysis and then provide with the proper outlook for the senior management in yes. terms of strategy so if that is being taken care by artificial intelligence so we are looking at a all together different level of disruption here yeah it is all together le- different level now one of those key use cases i keep seeing very frequently sujikar it might be very interesting for your audience is we talk to a lot of customers for uh, ai needs in the area of customer care how do you enhance the customer experience based on ai that's a big problem statement which lot of customers today are very interested in that and the kind of disruption that will cause is today uh, you you see at least in north america it that has started to happen is when you call in whether you really call your bank whether you call your telecom service provider or you call your you know utility provider not as a bots that are answering your calls you mm-hmm. know you can call a back and bank and ask okay you know it will recognize you uh, the, you can ask tell me about my account information or some basic faq kind of questions a lot of these bots today are capable of doing but now as the bot get more sophisticated now they can pretty much do everything that a call center agent can do today i think okay. much better and much better exactly and no wait times imagine see yeah. one cause for frustration for most of the customers is having to wait 30 minutes 45 minutes and sometimes up to hours when you call up a call center and just waiting and waiting for somebody to answer your call now imagine if you want to improve that experience on account of ai then you have this virtual assistants and imagine you are slapping on technologies like gpt3 and you are driving it in steroids to the level that at one point of time what they call turing test see if you heard of something called the turing test in a uh, turing test is if a machine interacts with you in such a manner you cannot differentiate between a machine whether it's a machine or a human okay but it will pass a turing test you will not even know that you are actually speaking to a, a bot so if i if i can do that through a bot there is a huge cost component that big companies uh, invest there is a huge cost element to maintaining this huge call centers throughout the world all of that cost if you get this right is significantly reduced or at some, some stage will probably go away i think uh, every business will jump on to that solution if it is provided even today yeah no it's already happening just uh, from the uh, of that cost if the i mean from my own experience of startups and all this i can i can understand that even from the cost point of view even if it is 20 to 30% higher than yeah. what is happening from manual uh, sources i think people will go with this solution because they know a lot of things get uh, sorted out because yes. of uh, and and most importantly like a call center agent ai doesn't have a bad day right it will perform optimally on every day <laughs> yes yes exactly so uh, coming here uh, my personal uh, example here in india also some of the banks with whom i have account with uh, the bots are making the calls and then trying to talk to me so even yeah. when i reply it is trying to reply back <laughs> appropriately but not i can say it's not to the level where we will feel okay i i, I am satisfied with this service but i think it has started so uh, uh, yeah as an extension to this uh, experience uh, in terms of ai Okay. and india indian manpower human resources being kind of base for most of the technology innovation and uh, services sector uh, across the world be it in us also okay we having that human resource capabilities now at least in this industrial revolution which is going to be driven by ai where are we standing in terms of country when compared to north america at this moment 
our Europe for that moment. So are we almost in tandem or maybe we are a lot to catch up? How are we looking at it? Great question. A great question, Sujikar. So, you know, the, you know, I would have been, I would have loved to say that we are on par. I would have loved to say that, even say that we are ahead. But the situation is we are kind of lagging behind in that race compared to China and US. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are nearly five to ten years behind in terms of what uh, in that, and we have to we have to catch up. There is no other way, but we have no choice but to catch up. Let me put it that way. Yes. And the reason I say that is in the future, because of the disruption that is caused by AI across practically every human vertical that you can imagine, it means in the future the countries that will be dominant will be the countries who will have the best AI. Yes. In AI, they can, who can uh, automate the maximum and whose AI is capable of working across every vertical. And then even uh, things like defense of the country, the con- very basic concept of how do you defend yourself, the concept of warfare, your military, all of that is going to be driven by AI. So this, it is very important for us to catch up in that game because China and US are ahead and they are and this is exponent. The gap is kind of exponentially increasing. Mm-hmm. So we simply have to catch up. So there is a lot of a first. That's why it, it's part of my mission to uh, when I hold through CEI live projects is to expose as many students as possible, encouraging them to that guys, you need to get into this now because as a as a country, we need this right now. We need highly skilled people in AI who are transforming India based on AI and for us, it's a huge opportunity because this will allow us to just leapfrog from where we are and go to the next generation. And in fact, even go ahead of China and, and, and the US. And because of the skill levels see, today, unfortunately, Sujikar Ji, what is happening is even in AI, see, for example, software, let's look at the concept of software, right? Information technology uh, is when really world started taking notice of India. I mean, all of us know that. But I think we missed a boat there because while we were very good at providing services, backend services, be able to implement and execute something in the backend, but we missed out the boat on building world-class products. I mean, we didn't have those Googles and Apples of the world. We didn't create those. Yeah, I mean, maybe course, an entrepreneurship viewpoint was missing then? Yes, absolutely. Entrepreneurship ecology was completely missing. Now I'm very hopeful that with the entrepreneurship ecology evolving and the knowledge and awareness of what AI can do, will actually allow us to leapfrog ahead of the others. And it's my firm belief, and I want to kind of play a role in that mission, what I really call AI for Bharat. So I think AI for Bharat too, I just want to kind of uh, kind of conclude my answer to this question, uh, Sujikar. One of those discussions that's going on in India, recently I was listening to a podcast. Uh, this was the chief data scientist of Reliance, and he was making a very interesting point. He was saying that, look, uh, the way AI was applied in the West, see, is based on their Western concept of materialism and how they look at the world. So, mm-hmm. if, you know, they want to maximize profits. They want to do, uh, I think, as, as I'm seeing, there's, there's some questions on how, how does AI, what if the AI makes the system, you know, humans, humans have some questions there. So what is happening in that is West looked at AI from a completely different perspective. How do they make their lives simpler? And they looked at it very differently. Now, I think India, we need to, we should not necessarily ape the West in uh, what they're trying to do. I think we have to take a original original viewpoint, if you will, in terms of AI. Look at the problems our country faces today yeah. and where we need to go and how AI needs to be evolved to apply to Indian needs. So I think we have to look at AI from a very, very different viewpoint and not necessarily go with how the West has been doing. It. I yes. think with that, I, I think prepare. adding a bit... Uh... To your viewpoint here, exactly, I believe in it and then strongly uh, agree to your viewpoint there. Uh, that is where I, I was reading through a uh, Public Water Cooper's report on AI uh, in India uh, for at least next five or six years. I was happy to come across uh, Niti Ayog and even Ministry of Commerce even four years back creating a work group to, cre- uh, to make a blueprint for AI utilization in various industries, including agriculture. Yes. Okay. And see how we can use it for our even public or uh, public utilities front as well in providing good governance and all. So uh, right now, can we at least be optimistic uh, from a Bharat point of view that we, at this moment, we are having a uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem 
maybe which is at least 15 years older now and so now looking at creating our own products or core product and solution rather than services themselves and yep. then second maybe government support our futuristic vision from the government end under the human resource capital which we have as a country so with these three uh, maybe if we so, can as you said and this gap more, if we can add now this one more important thing one more important uh, factor to this all all the factors that you said are absolutely correct and we have one more a very important resource that we have data let's not forget data because yeah, population of the effort, because of the efforts of government now and they have taken some really good decisions in terms of having all these digital platforms now all of this jandan uh, aadhar and all of these different uh, initiatives we have collected a lot of excellent information for us so in terms of citizen delivery delivery of services it can play a huge role actually ai because we have all of the data with us we have an entrepreneurial ecosystem now all it takes is to skill ourselves on ai that is only missing that is where maybe the support and uh, guidance from people like you would be paramount importance and for someone like us be it my ways also as we are the core product and my of my ways is all about personalized uh, yeah career guidance which has the ai and machine learning to the as depth as possible okay yes. and maybe your guidance uh, for people like my ways uh, maybe we can look at the aspect of yeah. catching us yeah. and maybe going beyond them in another 20 25 years time at least yeah, absolutely happy to help very mm-hmm. very very exciting discussion yeah thank you uh, suman ji uh, for your uh, i mean it was a very very insightful discussion and then we can see uh, the experience which you had coming out okay and i think this time is very very little sorry i i had to maybe um, take you uh, to different questions when you are about to explain further on the questions which i asked as such um, uh, thanks a lot uh, for your uh, time and the inputs here maybe as we are approaching 715 almost uh, we will take a question or two from um, yeah. the audience also uh, so sujikar what i have done is i have uh, pasted my linkedin uh, profile to this so i would encourage everybody who is on the audience please feel to reach out to me because i am very personally passionate about like sweeker just mentioned I'm very passionate about ai for bharat and as an organization even in cei we are Uh, driving all of those very exciting initiatives for example there are projects on some on precision agriculture we are uh, engaged in some of those other projects like on the military side as well building uh, adding ai to this lot of these drones so there's some really interesting work that we are doing as an organization so i'm very happy to engage with your audience uh, through my linkedin and happy to happy to support them in that we will we would love to have you uh, have these kind of uh, interactions with us as many as possible even though considering that you will have very little time for yourself to accommodate these kind of sessions but we'll be <laughs> with you maybe trying to follow it up to find some time from you from yeah, look so yeah. so sujika you want me to take one or two questions yeah yeah uh, one or two just... questions i think uh, coming to this human setup if i can rephrase it a bit uh, can yeah. we say because of the intervention of ai even till that uh, business development nations uh, to that level okay, uh, will the humans as such moving forward lose out on the genius or uh, genius gap if we can say gets created because of uh, lack of need to even think that way no i don't i don't necessarily so i don't necessarily think so so let me uh, qualify my answer saying that see throughout human uh, technology history and the our material progress since the time of industrial revolution so i think anushi asked that question so anushi if you see that every stage of technology evolution life is increasingly getting easier now in fact some argue that we are at a point of time in our history where although we see lot of issues in the world still we are at a most non non violent a portion of our history for the last 2000 years i mean many would ar- actually argue that yes, so yes, if you look much. at that yeah so i so i would i would think there is a lot more to accomplish in the, in the following generations actually in terms of how things can get simpler now your role as a human if you see today man as an animal lost all of those native animal kind of instincts long back but you know would if you consider that saying okay look we lost those instincts but we did something better our brain grew at the same time so in the future as you go towards ai gets gets more and more sophisticated i see a possibility strong possibility where human and machine intelligence intelligence will get integrated and in fact a, a new species might emerge where 
your augmentation of your own intelligence will be at an all time high now for let me give you an example elon musk has been working on this technology called in brain hacking the brain you hack into somebody's brain yeah. now he recently did a small demo i mean they are st- at the starting point of the process but they will get there and in that process they are seeing how can i embed a chip in my brain where even instead of using a mobile phone can i get information downloaded downloaded directly to my brain can i whatever not only download information but can it also help me process some of the information that is getting downloaded to my brain so you can imagine if you have embedded chips that are augmenting your own intelligence and what is the limit to that i mean you can't even imagine the kind yeah. of limits that yes, you have yes yes exactly so i think it's an uh, maybe there is no limit as you said and i think that is coming from a materialistic perspective when it is coming from america if i take that yeah. liberty of uh, putting that point there uh, from an indian perspective there maybe if you look at in a psychology or a philosophical point of view maybe uh, from an indian mindset we would look at uh, as the sustenance is being taken care of right now till now maybe the fight was for the sustenance of human beings okay to get the resources to make their life simple uh, uh, luxurious or whatever it is now as once all those are attained maybe we might look into understanding what we are as people looking in yes. word or whatever it is maybe we would use ai that way to an extent and no, no, no. Also, i think yeah, i think just add to the point in fact you very nice point you made i wish we had more time to describe it but maybe we'll do it next time i think next time we'll also talk about you are very rightly pointed out because the ai that is being developed in the west is a very materialist perspective of ai that's why india how we look at ai it must be uh, basically based on a dharmic tradition and how do you make sure that's an ai which which kind of sustains ourselves through the next not just generations but but for the longest possible time ahead and the way you should look at ai is a completely different area but we will talk about it next time i have some nice yes, point of that will that that will lead to uh, entirely different discussion and i think it will be very futuristic in nature as well yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe one last question uh, is there anything else again okay chance to get customized guidance from tech leaders and other yeah as uh, okay that is uh, sri bhai ji writing do we, uh, uh, do we have to go ahead with a few more questions or should i end it here yeah i think i don't see any more questions anyway yeah i think they are not i mean then we have to put in here anyways i think we are uh, even out of time and uh, i i don't want to extend this any further uh, at this moment at least because uh, we are beyond 20 minutes yeah and but so, so it's been absolute pleasure talking to you and uh, absolutely by uh, by all means i would love to continue engage uh, with you your team and uh, absolutely happy to discuss more on future sessions as well and thanks for inviting me and for this opportunity to talk to your audience pleasure is all ours sumanji so, thanks for your time yeah. for joining from canada and uh, sha, sha, lahari ji thanks for being in and then giving the introduction of suman kalyan ji and uh, yeah with suman ji as well as lahri ji i see lot of uh, collaboration possibilities and also guidance uh, needs as far as my os is concerned moving forward and even for the student community or the candidate community uh, we will try to see if uh, we can add much more value in association with you people so thanks a lot for uh, um, the keynote session it was a great interaction for me as well and uh, i mean i can see the deep deep insights and i so feel uh, this is very very little time i had So, to pack many things in it so thanks that way sumanji thank you for all the audience thanks for being part of this uh, uh, celebration one year celebration of ours uh, which we call uh, the enthusiastic summit 2021 uh, thanks for getting it a grand success and all the sessions be it uh, workshops be it project uh, uh, live project sessions which happened be it live uh, open sessions uh, all these will be made in, in the form of videos and uh, uh, various other content and across the next uh, one week or 10 days we'll be sharing them and then putting them on the uh, youtube and facebook and associated channels which are we have so uh, thanks a lot again everyone uh, have a good night um, and uh, have a good remaining thank you. part of sunday as well <laughs> thank, thank you thank you sir signing off from my Thank you, 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 Thank you,